Luke chapter 16, so as we finish this week, we're going to finish talking about our walking through our heaven and hell series. Today we're going to particularly finish um, talking about hell. I, I, I hope I hope you've understood and heard the heartbeat behind this, that this was really just, man, it's supposed to be an encouragement to us. It's, it's supposed to help us see that we have great hope in Jesus, but also show us that others can have great hope in Jesus also uh, for their sins and for their salvation. So that has been uh, the goal. Well, if you have your Bible and you're able, would you stand with me? Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19, we will read there to the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 16, verse 19, hear now the very word of God. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Verse 22, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to... Abraham's side, and the rich man also died and was buried. And, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime, Received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all of this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you, read this very carefully, may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him my my father's house. And I have five brothers so that they may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, as we walk through this today, would you help us understand the realities of hell, but the riches of grace? Lord, would you help us understand, God, how hell doesn't have to be an option. Eternal life can be the option. Lord, would you help us be encouraged by the fact that for those who are in Christ, you have already prepared a place for us in eternity with the Father. And Lord, for the one here this morning or watching at home who does not know Jesus as his or her personal Savior, God, would they come to realize this morning that they're so much better than just trusting in themselves. So Father, I pray this morning that you would stand in my body, that you would think with my mind and speak with my tongue all you would have us to know and to say and to do. And we'll give you the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. It's, It's no secret if you know me very well or know me at all. I love country music. Now, I don't love country music produced after 1999, but anything from the 70s, the 80s, and most of the 90s, man, I really like it. I still listen to The Wolf nowadays until they start playing classic country from 2010, then I, I switch the channel. But, but one of the things I love about country music is, and this isn't just only to country music, but that it tells a story. Oftentimes, it it includes a dog and a train or something like that and a truck, but nonetheless, it tells a story. And the more I listened to country music this week, I I realized how much country music actually has to say about heaven and hell. In fact, a couple couple songs that I really came to mind this week was one was uh, Hank Williams Jr., right? If heaven ain't a lot like Dixie. I don't want to go disappointed. It's not like Dixie. And then I think Joe Diffie, perhaps you remember, who's gone on to be with the Lord. He, he's saying, uh, prop me up beside a jukebox when I die. I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go tonight. And so I thought about that, right? Great theologians out there, George Strait amongst the best, of course, Keith Whitley, the second best. But nonetheless, it got me thinking about what country music people thought about heaven and hell. I ran across this interview with the, the great, but still not late, Willie Nelson, And he talked about his time. I don't know if you know this, but for a while there, 
Uh, Willie Nelson was a Sunday school teacher at the Metropolitan Baptist Church. He was a very famous Sunday school teacher, and not just that. He he said, man, I I just decided that I wanted to be a Sunday school teacher because I wanted to determine more and more about my faith, and I wanted to explore deeper issues. Somehow, as he began to explore deeper issues, he got further and further away from the gospel until one day the book that profoundly changed him it was a book called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ. And in it, I want you to hear what Willa Nelson says about the afterlife. From the first moment I considered the concept of reincarnation, it made sense. The old paradigm was just too cruel, just too unchristian, talking about the Bible. It was just too unchristian to be believed. If you die in your sin, you spend eternity in hell. How could the compassionate God of mercy ever set up such a system? On the other hand, I was drawn to the idea that you keep coming back till you get it right. Reincarnation seemed merciful and completely Christ-like. Jesus got it right the first time around and was, after all, God incarnate, perfect man. But the rest of us would need several lifetimes to shed our sins and learn the lessons necessary to heal our troubled souls. You think, well, that's just crazy, you know, celebrity talk. Well, no. That very thought is a thought that permeates our culture, even our churches today. That in the end, we'll all get a second chance, or man, there's going to be this reincarnated state where we can try to do it right the next time. But here's what we know about human nature. If we get a second chance, we'll mess that up too. And so the question we have to ask is, man, what does the Bible talk about in relation to hell and and eternality? And today, I just want to show you from the text that kind of the irreversibility of hell And there is no second chance. God bless Willie Nelson, but he's absolutely wrong. And and so is Joe Diffie, and so is Hank Williams Jr. on a number of things. But nonetheless, there isn't this second chance. There isn't this ability to reverse one's course once they are there. That's why it's so important that we talk about hell. And that's why it's so daunting and so kind of heartbreaking that people don't talk about hell anymore. I'm certainly been preaching 15 years, and just to be transparent, first time I've done it, but nonetheless, it's not a a popular topic, and I get it, but it's a needed topic, because if you really want to understand the full goodness and, and the full magnitude of God's grace, see a picture right into hell, and it'll show you. That's what we have in Luke 16 here. Jesus tells this parable, which I think really has elements of, of real life to it, but he tells this parable which we know is just kind of uh, this story that's used to explain a thought more clearly. And he, he tells this story about two men. You had the rich man and you had Lazarus. And so we're just going to walk through this kind of slowly to get a picture of the irreversibility of hell. The first thing we're going to look at here is I want you to see just kind of how these two men lived in contrast to each other. The rich man who was not named, but Lazarus who is. If you look there in the text, it said that the rich man... He, he, he dressed in purple and fine linen, and he feasted sumptuously every day. He was wealthy. He, he was not just wealthy, but he, he flaunted it. Purple, as you know, is the color of royalty. It's the color of wealth. It's the color that, hey, man, I, I do something. I am somebody. In fact, over in Mark chapter 15 and verse 16, when they were beating and ridiculing Jesus, the Bible tells us that they put purple linen on him. Oh, you're a king. You're, well, he, he, here's your royal colors. And they beat him. It, it's almost like this rich man was set apart. He, he lived this very opulent life uh, in, in full view of everybody, but also at the same time shut off. And then you have Lazarus, the poor man. The poor man was the scum of the earth. He was the scum of society. He had a chronic illness. Nobody wanted to be around him. Nobody liked him. He stood outside the store or at the off-ramp on the interstate with a a cup or a sign that said, I just need food. Nobody wanted to be around him. They didn't roll their window down for him. In fact, they locked his doors. All he could hope for was crumbs. All he could hope for was a little bit of food would fall off this rich man wearing purple's table, and he would get it. This would be what we would think of today if you see somebody out behind a restaurant dumpster diving for a little bit of food. Nobody would have cared for Lazarus. Even look, you, you can see back in the text where it says the, the dogs would lick his sores. Dogs had more compassion on people than people had on people. And by the way, in ancient Israel, 
Dogs were not man's best friend. They were a nuisance. They ran amok everywhere, and they did whatever they wanted, and people wanted to get rid of them. But here, even this lowly animal tried to give him relief. That's how they lived. One at the pinnacle of society and one under the foothills of society. But I think something else you see here is is how they died. Look back at the text. Verse 22, the poor man, he died and was carried by angels to Abraham's side. There's almost this great reversal in in position here. Where where this poor man on earth, Lazarus, this sick man, nobody wanted to be around him. Now in his death, he is escorted by angels. It says there to Abraham's bosom or Abraham's side, depending on which version you have. But he, he was escorted into heaven. Not only to heaven, but he got to sit right next to the most important figure in all of Jewish history. It's this great reversal that happened. Think about this. The poor man, the Lazarus, his last thoughts in his mind on earth, his last memories were pain, were hunger, sadness, sickness, loneliness. But his first thoughts in eternity was completeness, was wholeness, was free of pain, was joy, and was hope. He'd forgotten about those things on earth, as the Bible tells us, and all of a sudden he just celebrated in heaven. But look at the rich man. We see completely different here. The rich man, at the end of verse 22, also died and was buried. And in Hades, being tormented, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. The rich man died with a full belly and a fat bank account. By the way, it has nothing to do with him being rich is not why he's in hell. It has everything to do with what he believed. But he died, and he was buried, and he went to hell. Chances are he had a big funeral, bigger than you or I will ever have. Chances are his family used some of his money to hire people to come and even weep at the funeral. Did you know they did that? They would hire professional criers in ancient Israel. And they would come, and they would just act a fool at the funeral. You've been to those funerals, but those people aren't paid. And they would cry and they would weep. And so chances are there was a big to-do about him dying. But the complete opposite happened in his afterlife. Now think about this great reversal. It was the opposite. For Lazarus on earth, people kicked him. But in heaven, he was elevated and he was celebrated. But on earth, everybody revered the rich man. But in hell, there was no revering at all. He experienced immediately, look what it says there, torment and torture. So how did they live eternally? Lazarus was made fully whole. He was in great peace. But look what it says about the rich man in hell. He kind of had two different types of anguish. Number one, he had physical anguish. Look at it in verse 24. He called out, Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in what anguish. And look what Abraham reminds him of there in the text. Abraham says, so you want the poor man to do for you in hell what you never did for him on earth? No, that's not how that works. You're not going to get relief from your anguish. And that's what hell is, by the way. It is no relief from the anguish. But not just that. More so, I think, probably than the, the physical anguish is the emotional anguish. Look there in verse 27. He said, Then I beg of you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them lest they come to the place of torment. Let me just put that in different terms. Let him warn them so they don't end up in hell like I am. That's emotional torture. He he realizes that those that he loved or he thought he loved and those that he supported, man, they are going to endure the same fate as me. But notice, the implication here with Abraham's response is they heard the gospel on earth and they rejected it. You heard the gospel on earth and you rejected it. What makes you think even sending a ghost or somebody back from the dead is going to make them change their mind? And so here's what we know. The rich man has to spend all of eternity thinking, you know, I did not warn my brothers. I absolutely think he will remember that all of his days. Imagine being in hell like the rich man, knowing that you did not tell someone 
and that they were going to end up your cellmate there also. As bad as the physical torment will be, imagine that emotional toll. Dad, could you just imagine that, dads, for a moment, the emotional toll that would take knowing you never warned your child or moms or grandparents? Could you imagine the emotional toll that that will take on you? You see, this parable is a parable of great reversal. And you'll see this throughout the message, but now now you see it. Those who depend on themselves on earth become beggars in the afterlife. And those who depend on Jesus have to beg for nothing. What we learn about this rich man is storing treasures on earth turns into poverty and eternity. So here's what I want you to see from this story this morning. And here's what I want you to know about hell is hell does not destroy the consciousness. The rich man knew exactly where he was, and he knew Abraham and Lazarus. There's this thought that, well, when you go to heaven, and we talked about, or hell, and we talked about this in heaven, you know, you're not going to remember everything. Everything will be there. No, no, no. Notice what the rich man did. He recognized everybody. He recognized the poor guy that he stepped over to get in, you know, on his camel every day. He recognized those people. He recognized, he remembered his brothers. He didn't lose his consciousness. Everything wasn't wiped. He wasn't in a trance. He was there. And the worst part of not having our conscience destroyed is that we know all of those opportunities that we missed. Hell does not destroy consciousness. You're very conscious of what's going on. He very much knew he was being tortured and tormented. There's no doubt in his mind he knew his fate. The second thing is this. Hell does not destroy identity. We talked about this uh, in our Heaven series. Man, when you go to heaven, you're going to be the good parts of your personality. If you're funny, you're going to be funny. If you have a great disposition, you'll have all that. That's the great thing about being made whole. You're not going to be wiped and become like this programmable zombie. You'll be who God created you to be, just the best version of that. Likewise, hell does not destroy identity. He, he remembers every day, man, I was rich on earth. I had purple linen. I had everything that I wanted. He did not forget who he was. But remember, he, he was self-centered on earth. And what was he in hell? Self-centered. What did he say about Lazarus? Just have him come and dip his finger and put it on my tongue. Who was he thinking about at that moment? Himself. He says that long before he says that about his brothers. His true identity is showing. He was number one on earth. And he's number one in his world in hell. Third thing hell does not destroy is hell does not destroy the memory. Verse 25, what does Abraham say? Child, remember. In heaven, I talked about this before the service today. In heaven, um, there are no more tears. And, And our memories will be sanctified only to remember, I believe, that which is good. Like, that's part of that process. But hell is the complete opposite. Your, your hurtful memories will be at the forefront. The, the opulent life that the rich man lived has now become his greatest nightmare. Catch that. That which he thought was setting him apart has now singled him out and put him in a place of torment. Flip over to Isaiah with me for a moment, Isaiah 65. We're going to look at two texts because people will say, well, I don't think you'll have those memories, and and they'll point to this, but Isaiah 65 in verse 17 says, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. So people say, look, you're not going to remember anything. Well, look back to what he says there in 65 and 16. So that he who blesses himself on the land shall bless himself by God of the truth. And he who takes an oath in the land shall swear by the God of truth. Because the former troubles are forgotten and they are hidden from their eyes. What's that talking about there? Heaven. That's a promise to believers. That's not a promise to unbelievers. In heaven, your members will be perfect. I'm just telling you what the text says. You can flip over and see this. Revelation chapter 21. I think if I were going to circle a text from today, this would be it. Revelation 
21 and verse 4. And he will wipe away every tear from their eye, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Listen to me very carefully. That promise is only for people who will be in heaven. You want no more pain? You don't want to remember that bad thing that happened in your life? You don't want to remember that hurtful whatever it was? That's only possible through Jesus. That's only possible in heaven. What we learn here very clearly is that there are memories in hell and they are not present. Listen to this quote I heard by a writer this week. He said, the power of memory will deepen and magnify the joys of heaven. Amen, right? And it will agonize the consciousness and intensify the regrets of those condemned in a devil's hell. That's serious, right? This is nothing to play with. This isn't something that passes like the vapor of an eye. This is something that happens and happens and happens. You want sermons on hell, here you go. Hell happens for eternity and it's hot and it's torturous. But here's what I want to leave you with, three things. When it comes to hell, we cannot be, number one, indifferent. We cannot be indifferent about hell. People have souls, Everyone that you come across with, this side of the grave, has a soul. And we either have to do one of two things. We either have to to love them and share the gospel with them, or we have to hate them and not share the gospel with them. But there is no in-between. We cannot be indifferent. If we really believe hell is real, we cannot be indifferent. Perhaps you know the the famous magicians, Penn and Teller, and I heard this on the, the news this week, actually. Penn is a devout atheist. I mean, he's actually a pretty combative atheist. But every time at his show, inevitably, somebody will go up to him and share the gospel with him. And this reporter said, well, why don't you just tell him to kick rocks and get lost? He said, well, here's why. He's like, now, I don't believe in what they believe in. He was like, but they're doing what they're supposed to do. He said, they love their God and they love me so much that they want to warn me of this impending doom. Who am I to take that joy from them? This is an atheist that said that. We cannot be indifferent to eternity, and we cannot be indifferent to hell. Number two, we cannot be selfish. Heaven or hell is not a secret to be kept. This is not something that we say, I've got it, you want it, good luck. Man, this is something that we share. We cannot wish anyone to go to hell, because what we've just learned is, man, it's a torturous place, and Jesus certainly didn't want anyone to go to hell. That's why Jesus spoke more about hell and its details than he did anything else. Why? He wanted people to know that there's a better way. Cannot be selfish. If you remember as a child, we can't light the fire and put it under a bushel, right? We're going to let it shine. And then number three, and hear this very tenderly, we cannot be ignorant about the topic. I talked to a guy the other day, goes to church here. He said, you know, I'm 48 years old, 48, 49 years old. He said, I've been in church my whole life. He said, this is the first time I've ever heard a sermon on hell or something to that effect. Of course, I didn't really know how to respond. I was like, okay, cool. (laughs) But listen to me, as, as hell becomes less in vogue, it cannot be less vogue for us as believers. Just because some guy like me doesn't stand up here and preach on it doesn't give us an excuse not to understand it so that we can warn others. You are a priesthood of believers. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to get the truth of the gospel and the truth of hell out. Here's what I want you to hear. I want you to lean in on this as we close. Why can we not be ignorant about the truth of hell? I want you to write this down. You've probably already written it down, but please, if you have a pen, write it down. Why can we not be indifferent or selfish or ignorant about the topic? You ready? It's really simple. Because there are no second chances. Let me say it again in case you missed it. Why do we have to rescue the perishing? Why do we have to warn those who are slipping day by day closer and closer into torment and torture? You ready for it? I'm going to say it one more time because there are no second chances. We cannot be indifferent. We cannot be selfish. We cannot be ignorant. Unfortunately for my friend, Willie Nelson, he's wrong. There isn't an opportunity to get it right again. We get one shot. So let's do this.
Let's warn the people, but let's give them hope that Jesus saves. Let's pray.